This is going to be chapter 17, part 1, Nutrition and Metabolism. Cellular metabolism. The areas we're going to talk about are going to be carbohydrate metabolism, cellular hypoxia, alternate catabolic pathways, lipid metabolism, protein metabolism, complications of diabetes mellitus, dietary fats and cholesterols, nucleic acid metabolism, and then we're going to have a general overall summary of the cellular metabolism. All right. Introduction. Cells are chemical factories that break down organic molecules to obtain energy, usually in the form of ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Nutrients that will go into this, and we will absorb those through the small intestine, are going to be water, vitamins, ions, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. And we normally obtain these from our diet. Cellular metabolism, a few terms here. Uh, metabolism being the top one refers to the chemical reaction that occurs in the body. Next word here is going to be catabolism, um, breakdown of organic molecules. If we think of catabolism as cannibalistic, and we're going to have anything that we have stored in this in this form or fashion, like in this in the area of fat or proteins or calcium ions in the bone, all of that is up for play. If we need it, we're going to catabolize it and break it down. Anabolism, the synthesis of new organic molecules. So anabolism, we are going to make new molecules. Uh, so we can take part A and part B and completely make another part, which is C, if we needed to. Uh, four basic reasons for synthesizing organic compounds. One, to perform structural maintenance and repairs. Two, to support growth. Three, to produce secretions. And four, to build nutrient reserves. Figure 17.1, this gives an overall general view of the breakdown of, of uh, things and the building up. Um, nutrient pool is obtained from the diet, so let's kind of start there. If we needed things to maintain repairs or growth secretions or store some reserves, uh, somewhere over here in the cell, the cell says I need more fat supply. Uh, we would break down some things so that we could build up others. This nutrient pool from amino acids, lipids, and simple sugars goes into a catabolic state in the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria is in nucleus. It's a little kidney-like organelle, actually in um, the cytoplasm. So the mitochondria <clears throat> generates our heat, or one of the things that generate our heat along with our muscles, and produces our adenosine triphosphate, and this gives us energy, energy to do locomotion, contractions, intercellular transport, cytokinesis, endocytosis, all of our cells to work, all of them run off of ATP. 17.2, uh, these are the things that can go, and these are, these are both ways here. We have amino acids, we can make proteins if we need them. Glucose, we can definitely form that into glycogen. Fatty acids, we can definitely make into triglycerides. Or if we have those, we can break those down as well. Break them down into fatty acids, glucose, or amino acids that would all be utilized from the mitochondria to produce this energy, which is in the form of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Byproducts of mitochondrial uh, respiration are going to be water, and CO2. And this is cellular respiration. Carbohydrate metabolism, glycolysis. Glycolysis, or the lysis of glucose, is a breakdown of glucose into pyruvic acid. And this is going to be very important to remember. This pyruvic acid is what goes into the mitochondria and will generate us or allow us to create ATP. Anaerobic metabolism, or my apologies, aerobic metabolism, which means with oxygen. Activity responsible for ATP production, cellular respiration, glucose and oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. Essentially go into the mitochondria, along with a few other things, and due to the enzymes that we have present in there, we easily can make adenosine triphosphate out of this. Carbohydrate metabolism continued. Glycolysis, or the breakdown of sugar, requires the following. Obviously, the first thing on the list is going to be glucose molecules. Uh, appropriate cytoplasmic enzymes uh, are going to be 
very important as well. Um, ATP and ADP, adenosine triphosphate for energy, and adenosine diphosphate to put. Now, what we're going to see here, and to put the phosphate group on, what we're going to see here is a lot of times, most of the time, we take ADP, adenosine diphosphate, which means two, and we'll throw another phosphate group onto there, which turns it into adenosine triphosphate three. NAD, nico nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, a coenzyme that removes hydrogen atoms. Now this is going to kind of be important whenever we start talking about what the actual mitochondria does, because it removes those hydrogen atoms so that it can place them between what's called the sister, cistern, which is essentially the folds on the inner and outer side of the mitochondria. And how it does this is it pulls off hydrogen ions and places them in between this inner membrane. Now, these hydrogen ions, what we're going to see later, give us the biggest amount of ATP molecules whenever they go something through, through something called ATP synthase. Uh, coenzymes, organic molecules usually derived from vitamins, uh, must be present for enzymatic action to occur. And again, why do we use an enzyme? We use an enzyme because it doesn't require us any ATP. So we have to have all of these enzymes present so that they can go from one to another to another to another to make ATP. All right, so this is figure 17.3 in your book, and it kind of summarizes glycolysis. And there's some important areas to point out in this. Let's just kind of run it at the top here. You have glucose, and this is going to cost you an ATP molecule here and an ATP molecule here. And essentially what it does is it borrows a phosphate group off of it at each one of those stages. So this just requires you two ATPs. It's broken down further. Whenever it gets broken down a little bit more from the mitochondria, you get two NAD. This pulls off a hydrogen molecule and makes NADH. Now, the NADH is going to be important because it's what's going to go actually to the mitochondria. This is all happening in the cytoplasm with the breakdown of glucose. This NADH is going to actually go to the mitochondria for processing, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, then, whenever it gets towards the end of it, we actually get back two ATP molecules out of here. So we get four ATP molecules in this area here. And this forms something called peruvic acid. Now, it costs us two, but we get back four. So we have a net gain of two ATP molecules. All right, I'm going to erase this and kind of summarize some things here. All right. In step two, by the time that we hit step two, we have lost two ATP molecules. By the time that we hit step five, we gained four. So two minus four from glycolysis, or the breakdown of sugar, we gain two ATP molecules. Carbohydrate metabolism continue. Energy production within the mitochondria. Glycolysis yields a net gain of two ATP molecules. The tricyclic, the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle within the mitochondria enzyme and the coenzyme actions turn peruvic acid into support for ATP production. Peruvic acid to citric acid. Now we're going to talk about the Krebs cycle here in just a second, but its main goal in life, let's just review this here really quick. From the breakdown of glucose, it forms peruvic acid. And peruvic acid through the Krebs cycle is converted to citric acid. Now, this is why some people call it the citric acid cycle. From the Krebs cycle, we get a lot of high-energy um, compounds produced. Uh, NADH is one of those. And FADH2. This is the two areas, two compounds, high energy compounds that we get created from this. 
those high energy compounds in the Krebs cycle are put into something called the electron transport system. Embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, the electron transport system consists of an electron transport chain comprised of a series of protein pigment complexes called cytochromes. And this is where we're going to see things like cytochrome A, cytochrome B, cytochrome C, and so on. The cytochromes bring hydrogen into the inner mitochondrial matrix. The kinetic energy powers attach to the phosphate, attaching phosphate to adenosine diphosphate, making adenosine triphosphate. 95%, and this is going to be important, of your body's energy, ATP, is produced in the electron transport system or the electron transfer chain. All right. Now, one more slide. So, this is the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. Tricarboxylic carboxylic acid cycle. My apologies. Uh, or the citric acid cycle. It has many names. This was kind of figured out by a guy named Hans Adolf Krebs in about the 1930s. So from then, we, we kind of call it the Krebs cycle. That's where it got that name. The tricarboxylic carboxyl acid cycle, or the TCA cycle, and that's what we're calling it in this book. Um, <clears throat> actually is another word for citric acid. So the citric acid cycle also was deemed by other science uh, books as well. All right, so we get this from glycolysis up here, which is pyruvic acid. From this, those coenzymes helped by vitamins or created by vitamins kind of start assisting this pyruvic acid. They'll give off some CO2. This NADH is formed. Now watch where this NADH goes, all right? So acetyl-CoA then brings it into the Krebs cycle. We make citric acid. And whenever we make citric acid in the cycle, and this is inside the mitochondria, we get NADH. And this is going to head out towards there. And then five carbons, more CO2 is produced. We get, get another NADH. Um, we gain an ATP molecule off of this. Actually, two total. And then one up here, I believe, as well. Uh, as this process continues, and these are coenzymes and enzymes themselves changing the pyruvic acid into the form that it needs. So over here, we're going to remove some more hydrogen, essentially, from the TCA cycle, and we're going to get the FADH2 and the NADH, more NADH. So these are all headed towards the electron transport system. Now, quick review. Glycolysis, we netted two ATP molecules. In this process here, we net two more. So that equals four ATPs total. Now, here's the problem. We cannot run off of four ATP molecules. This is where we create most of our ATP at. So from this whole process, including the electron transport system, we get 36 ATP molecules total. Now, it cost us two. So what we're going to get is we're going to get 34 net gain out of this. 30 of them were made in the electron transport system. Keynote as well, the byproduct of the electron transport system is water. It runs off of oxygen. The TCA cycle, or the Krebs cycle, off gases or produces CO2. So byproducts of the mitochondria are going to be CO2 and water. This is the electron transport system. Now, what we essentially do here is this thing has two membranes, an outer membrane and then an inner membrane. In the inner membrane, we run the NADH and the FADH2 through these coenzymes. What it essentially does is it pulls out hydrogen. Now, this is called chemiosmosis. 
and I'm going to explain why it's called kidney osmosis. We get a high amount of hydrogen out here, and it starts to have its own chemical push from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. It finds this item called ATP synthase. Now what the ATP synthase does is as we're using these phosphate groups, it kind of houses and keeps readily available ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So as these hydrogen ions come through this ATP synthase portal, what it essentially does is it starts generating ATP. Clinical note, cellular hypoxia. Oxygen is essential for normal glucose metabolism. Glycolysis does not require oxygen. Produces two ATP molecules. The oxygen if oxygen is adequate, pyruvic acid enters the, the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. The TCA cycle generates two more molecules of ATP. Hydrogen ions are removed in the TCA cycle and enter the electron transport system. The electron transport chain passes NADH and FADH2 through the chain. Through the electron transport system, 36 molecules of ATP are produced. Now remember, it cost us two, and four were created, two by glycolysis, and then two in the Krebs cycle. So really, the ETS, or the electron transport system, produced us 30. Please remember that oxygen is an essential part of this. This whole electron transfer system does not work without oxygen. So you will go into something called an anaerobic or without oxygen state of metabolism. Alternate catabolic pathways continue. Carbohydrate synthesis. Low glucose has a smaller, smaller effect than actually low oxygen. Many cells can switch from one nutrient to another. Many cells can also switch from glucose to lipids. Lipids is a high energy compound. From this peruvic acid and amino acids that are being produced by the cell, we can enzymatically create glucose. And if we need to store it at that point, store it in the form of glycogen. This is a process we just looked over. Glycogen is broken down, which is glycolysis, two ATP molecules, three carbon uh, immediates, which make it peruvic acid. This is before it goes into the mitochondria. Acetyl A touches it. CO2 is produced. We essentially go through the Krebs cycle. We make NADH and FADH2. Those two high energy compounds are run through the electron transfer system. We get 30 from ETS. We get four from the upper process. And it costs us two. Or actually we get 32 and four and it costs us two. 36 total, but it costs us two ATP molecules to run that. Carbohydrate synthesis. Cells cannot reverse glycolysis, so we can't throw it in reverse. It isn't a reversible reaction once we break glucose down. The synthesis of glucose from a non-carbohydrate precursor molecule is called gluconeogenesis, or the production of new sugar. In the liver, the skeletal muscle of glucose is stored as gly glycogen in the liver and skeletal muscles. So the muscles store glucose as glycogen in, in chains, essentially, of sugar, polysaccharide. Um, the liver stores glycogen as well. Our primary storage spot for glycogen is in the liver. Lipid metabolism. Lipid catabolism, lipids are broken down into pieces that can be converted into peruvic acid or channeled directly into the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle. Breaks lipids into two carbon fragments known as ketones. Now, that should be made a pretty pretty big note on those two things. Whenever we break down lipids, we get ketones. So if a person has is in DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, ketones are highly acidic. So this person has tons of sugar, but they can't utilize it. And from that, to, to generate energy for their body, they have tapped into their fat stores. A cell generates 144 ATP molecules from the breakdown of 18 fatty acid molecules, which this is a high energy producer. 
problem is, is we cannot take a bunch of these, or these ketones here. Lipid and energy production. Lipids are hard to access than carbohydrates, and this is the, the switch for turning on energy production. If we have a low switch, then we're going to run off of glucose. If we have a high energy production, then we're going to tap into some lipids. Figure 17A, and these are all of the products that are synthesized, synthesized off the of lipids. Fatty acids, which gives us steroids. The kidney is going to house those. Prostaglandulins, which allow for inflammation, and that's a good thing, the immune response. And then phospholipids. All of our cells have a phospholipid bilayer. And this all runs off of byproduct production from acetyl A and the breakdown of glucose. Or tap into fats. We have a glyceride, we have a fatty acid. This acetyl A will put, turn it into or make it to into peruvic acid and run it through the Krebs cycle, which will give us a large amount of ATP molecules. Lipid metabolism continue. Lipid synthesis. The synthesis of lipids is known as lipogenesis, or new lipid production. Glycerol is synthesized from an intermediate three-carbon product of glycolysis. The synthesis of most other types of lipids, including steroids and almost all fatty acids, begin with acetyl-CoA. This is so essential. Everything that we're talking about here, as far as uh, protein, lipid catabolism, glucose, um, Metabolism through the ETS or the electron transport chain all starts with acetyl-CoA. Lipid transport and distribution is the next topic here. So lipid transport and distribution. Most lipids circulate in the bloodstream as lipid proteins or lipoproteins. Lipid protein complexes that contain triglycerides and cholesterol within an outer coating of phospholipids and proteins. And this is what an actual lipoprotein is. Two major groups of lipoproteins are low-density lipoproteins, or LDLs, and high-density lipoproteins, or HDLs. These lipoproteins are formed in the liver and contain few triglycerides. Their main roles are to shuttle cholesterol between the liver and other tissues, in case the other tissues need a fat supply. Protein Metabolism the first, step in the, the first step in the removal of an amino acid, the mean group, requires coenzyme B, or productin. All proteins are composed from 20 amino acids. Amino acid catabolism, transamination, attaches the amino group of an amino acid to another carbon chain, creating a new amino acid. Demineation. This prepares the amino acid group for breakdown in the tricyclic acid cycle. Demineation is the removal of an amino group in a reaction that generates an ammonia molecule. Ammonia is highly toxic. The liver is the primary site of demineation. Liver cells combine with carbon dioxide with ammonia to produce urea, and this is excreted in the urine. I promise you, if your ammonia levels are high, very simply, your brain may swell, and it will cause encephalitis. Warnicke's encephalitis is an example of this, or very, very similar. <clears throat> protein catabolism continued. Amino acids and protein synthesis, there are 10 essential amino acids. Eight of the 10 can be synthesized, and this is by our own body and product. Two of these, cannot, we cannot produce enough in enough quantities, and those are arginine and histidine. Other amino acids that can be produced in quantities are called non-essential amino acids. Protein deficiency disease is developed when an individual does not consume adequate amounts of the essential amino acids. Clinical note, complications of diabetes mellitus. One, hypoglycemia, or low, low sugar levels, is considered to be less than 50 milligrams per deciliter. Now, most normally, whenever we look at a glucose, we say a normal value is 80 to 120. But we consider hypoglycemia anything that's less than 50 milligrams per deciliter. Hyperglycemia, high glucose levels, and the reason most people have high glucose levels is because of inadequate insulin. Insulin is responsible also for the storage of lipids. Insulin allows sugar to pass into the cell via facilitated diffusion. 
DKA, and we're going to talk about these two. Dehydration, DKA is diabetic ketoacidosis. And from that, you get dehydration, inadequate insulin, vomiting, coma, ketones, give off a fruity breath, and you'll get Kussmaul's respiration because of the acidosis. The other one on our list is non-ketotic, hypoalbuminolytic coma. Now you can get blood sugar levels up to a thousand with this. Osmolarity climbs and dehydration of the of the intercellular compartment, and this causes an intercellular acidosis. <clears throat> so let's talk about these two here for just a second. Let me blink out the screen. All right. So in DKA, on the cell, we don't have insulin allowing sugar open passage. And this is what insulin does. We put insulin on the surface of that cell, and this is created by the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, and it allows sugar into the cell so the glycolysis can occur. If we do not have insulin, the sugar remains outside the cell. The reason people get in diabetic ketoacidosis is because they will metabolize a fat. Whenever you metabolize or cannibalize fat, you get a product of a ketone. The ketone is what gives you the ketoacidosis. Ketones are then running on the, in the vascular system in the extracellular compartment, and what essentially happens is, is the ketone's acidic. So this is going to change your overall acid base. Also, since this patient has blood glucose levels that are greater than you know, 300 and going up, most of the time we'll find a DKA patient that's greater than 600. Needless to say, the, the higher the glucose level, the more osmotic shift that we're going to get. If you put a large molecule substance in the vasculature, it's going to pull fluid towards it. This is going to increase the glomerular filtration rate in the kidney. Proximal loop, distal convoluted tubule, and we're going to get more urine production occurring in the glomerulus in the, in the loop of pinlet. All right, so that, there's kind of the problems in the DKA. Now, one other thing, and I'll let DKA go here. The reason someone has Kussmaul's respirations, the ketones are acidic. They change the acid level of the overall body. The chemoreceptors that are located in the CSF, this will adjust respiratory patterns. So the acidosis that is present at the, at the chemoreceptor sites in the brain increase respiratory rate. The increased respiratory rate is what we generally will see deep respirations and kusmols. All right. Oh, I forgot one. Non-catotic hyperosmolar coma. Let's talk about that one. So in NKHC, or non-catotic hyperosmolar coma, I'm going to talk you through a little story here. So... I have a beaker, and this is a science experiment. And what I'm essentially going to do here, this is a heat lamp. And I have put an acid solution, and the acid solution that's in here is an acid solution. The pH on it is 5.0. All right, so I put the heat lamp on and forget all about this on a Friday. I go home, come back on Monday morning, and I look at my sample. And I say, oh no. I got about that much water left in that beaker. Now, if I tested the pH of that solution now, do you think it would still be 5.0 or would it be more acidic? And the answer is, as most of y'all 
we're seeing at this point, it would be more acidic because we have concentrated the solution. Now what that's going to do is that is essentially going to create an intracellular acidosis. Let me explain how. In the non-ketotic, no ketone, hyperosmolaric coma, the type, this is a type 2 diabetic problem. The type 2 diabetic has insulin resistance. So their sugars could get uncontrolled and get high, but what we're going to do is we're going to have all that sugar located in the vessels or free floating. It's not going to be allowed in the cell. They will not make ketones because their cells won't go to fat. They'll, they'll continue trying to work the glucose. But the high osmolaric pressure of that sugar in the vessels causes an extracellular to intravascular shunt and then an intracellular to extracellular shunt or the movement of fluid. Now that's going to crenate that cell. So when we look at their overall acid base, they are going to be acidic. They are going to have an intracellular acidosis. All right, clinical note, dietary fats and cholesterol. Cause of coronary artery disease and atherosclerosis. Intake under about 300 milligrams a day. Vital functions in the body, um, dietary fats have. Precursor to several steroid hormones. Uh, simple rule to reduce cholesterol. If your values are below 200 total cholesterol, that's, that's pretty good. 200 to 239, you should probably modify your diet. Greater than 240. Uh, more drastic changes. Over 350 need probably to be put on a statin or some kind of drug therapy for the high cholesterol. Nucleic acid metabolism. Living cells contain both DNA and RNA. The DNA contained in the nucleus is absolutely essential to long-term survival of the cell. RNA catabolism is the breakdown of RNA. It should be an R instead of an E there. Of RNA. The nucleotides are disassembled, disassembled into individual nucleotides. Adenine and guanine cannot be catabolized. Instead, they undergo demineation and are excreted as uric acid. If you need a review on this, nucleic acid synthesis, chapter 3 under DNA replication. Summary of cellular metabolism. <clears throat> No one cell can perform all the anabolic or the building up or the breaking down operations, catabolic operations required by the whole body. Homeostasis can be preserved only when metabolic activities of tissue, organs, and organ systems are all coordinated. You are going to require lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins. Your body's mitochondria breaks down the glucose very simply by glycolysis into pyruvic acid. Acetyl-CoA A then helps transform fats or pyruvic acid to NADH and FADH2 so that it can go through the electron transport chain and create ATP. Proteins are also powered off of this and the DNA replication amino acids and nucleic acids. All of this is involved. Peruvic acid assists in the development of amino acids. Amino acids assist in tricyclic or the Krebs cycle and the development of acetyl-CoA. This ends part one. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, Roy Smith, 405-219-7613 or smithr at